Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to something completely different. This time I'm not going to tell you about a new restoration. I'm going to tell you what I do before I start a restoration. I know that might sound nuts, but I get a lot of questions, especially on email, where people ask me, you know, where do I get schematics? Uh, where do I get tubes? What tubes do I need? Uh, what do I do when I start a project? Or what makes me decide to actually go ahead with a project? Sometimes I have various choices. When I started the hobby, I had one radio and I'd finish that and then order another one. Uh, at the moment, I've got a couple or more than that waiting in the wings, especially one that I'm dying to start, a really monster project, which I'll be starting next week. But what I wanted to do is to give you a bit of a rundown on the information that I collect, where I collect it, and how I actually go about doing this restoration process. Now, everybody can have a different method. I know that I sometimes get sidetracked in my own methods, but generally, these are the steps that I follow. And uh, if that sort of thing interests you, stick around and enjoy the video. This is where all these projects start, on the pedestal, on the rotating pedestal. And the first thing I need to do is to determine whether I want to restore this. And of course, I bought it, I like it, I like the look. So yes, I want to restore it. That's the first decision made. If it doesn't excite you, go on to something else. This particular radio excites me because it's a 60s radio. I can tell that from the design. It's more modern. It's actually in very, very good shape which is a start. So there's nothing obvious here that is not uh, fixable, restorable, renewable, no broken glass. I'm not saying that you would uh, put it aside if there was, but it certainly makes it easier to carry on. And the first thing I need to do is now to look inside and determine whether this thing has got any major flaws that would make a restoration impossible. So far, it's passed the test. Looks nice. Let's have a look at the back. If you look at the back of a radio and you see pieces removed, and it happens a lot, Transformers removed. No tubes isn't a problem, but I've seen transformers removed. I've seen radios without speakers. I've seen all sorts of things just hacked out of the back of a chassis. Somebody obviously could have taken this to finish another one, to restore another one. If that is the case, there's no point going on. There are a few things you need to check when you actually start the restoration, like the power transformer, make sure that's good. The output transformer, be nice if that's good, because replacing components can become a little bit complex. But this one seems to have it all there. If we look closer, we see a pretty hefty power transformer here. It's got uh, multiple uh, mains voltage selectors here. You can do the 220, you can go to the 110, 127 for the states. So this thing is what one would expect. Output transformer over there. The tubes seem to be here. This is the power tube and this is the ECL86. This was actually the reason this thing uh, sat in storage here for a while because I was waiting for these tubes to arrive. I wasn't sure if this was any good. There's another one there, another one there. These are normally pretty standard tubes. We'll look at the tubes in a minute. There's obviously been some work in here. This zip tie was not original, definitely not original. But other than that, it looks pretty good. It looks complete. This is obviously a more modern radio because it's got a PC board, but that's not a problem. I don't see anything here that would stop me going ahead with this project. The speaker looks pretty nice and it's a nice big speaker. And it's got two electrostatic tweeters on the side there. So this radio should actually produce some pretty good sound if we can get it all done. Now, what do I need to do next? Well, first of all, I need to find information on this particular radio. And this is where the first challenge comes in. I know this is a Blaupunkt Sultan because it says so right here. What it doesn't say is what model is it? It's actually got a tube chart over here. So I know what tubes this thing uses. There's a lot of information on the antenna. That's not important for now. I need to find out what model it is. And I don't know. There are various models in the uh, Sultan range, Blaupung Sultan range. So there are various model numbers. I don't know which one it is. So I don't know exactly which uh, set of schematics or surface manuals I need to go for. And before I start a project, that is the second thing that I'm going to do. So first thing, is it restorable? Is it redeemable? Yes. Secondly, can I find information? Now, how do I do that? Time for the computer. And the first place I normally go to for European radios is this particular site, nvhr.nl. And the reason I go to this one is I've been very, very fortunate with this particular website in finding service manuals. So the first thing I'll do is go to schemas, which is schematics. Click on there. You type in Blaupunkt for the brand and Sultan for the model. And here we go. These are all the Sultans that they have. And of course, I need to find out which one it is. Now, it's quite easy because this particular site gives you photographs of all the models. 
It's not the only one. I'll talk about a couple of others in a minute. But this particular one, as I said, has been very good for me. If I go down here, I can see it's none of these, none of these, none of these. That looks promising. This one here looks promising. Carry on, carry on. This one looks definite. I don't know whether it's the resolution of the picture or not, but these uh, keys here, these buttons seem to be that gray plastic, which is what we've got on ours. I think this is it. And it says 24300 Sultan, 1964. And we click on here and look at what we've got. We've got a full service manual on here. In English as well. This is very rare, but obviously it's more common with the, uh, with the later versions. I am not sure that this is the exact model that I have. There is something that gives me a hint, and that's the uh, valid for set number. This is the reference numbers. It's valid for sets beyond V835001. And the one I've got is V839963. So it would seem to be correct, but I'm not sure whether this reference number is only for a different model number or whether it's for all this, uh, this range. I'm going to assume it is. If I find something that contradicts the information, I'll know I'm wrong and I'll have to go look again. But this one sounds really promising. It's got all these service instructions, the alignment instructions, the alignment points and components that you have to adjust, everything you need for a full RF and IF alignment, both on AM and FM. And it's also got this layout, which um, actually matches mine pretty well. There's that open space here, which I thought something had been removed from, but it's not. That PC board is obviously used for a different model as well. And it looks like everything is the same as what I have on mine. But more importantly, I have a really good schematic. The detail on here is perfect. This is a very, very good scan. All the text is visible. You know, I could zoom in and if, if I needed to, but I can see the text, the component numbers, component values, all very clear. As usual, this kind of uh, service sheet or schematic sheet has a lot of um, extra information. We've got all our two pins over here so that you can measure voltages. You see that? It says what current goes into each pin and what voltage you should measure there. So this is really, really good when you're trying to do fault finding on these radios. Furthermore, they've got other information here that you normally wouldn't expect, but they've got things like um, uh, resistor power ratings, depending on the symbol itself for a resistor. We also know what type and uh, rating of capacitors we need based on the drawing itself. They give us the switching diagram so that you can do fault finding if necessary. Overall, it's fantastic. It's got all the information you need. I really do hope this is the correct one. There's also something else here. They've got a little drawing for a typical dummy antenna internal dummy antenna only for AM. So you can build this dummy antenna and use your signal generator over there into your antenna jack. This is for the RF alignment. I've got one built into my bench unit, so I don't need it. But if you did, here we go. They've got all the information you can possibly want on this one piece of paper. I think this is great. And if we carry on, we've got more information and more importantly, we've got our um, dial string diagrams. And I know that this particular radio has got the AM dial broken. So this will be great. It'll be very useful. And they've even got the board layout, which again makes things a lot easier. Here's that open patch that we had. So this one seems pretty good. So I'm going to download it. Another website that I use quite often is this one, DocTSF. This is French. And if I go down here and look for Blaupunkt, let's have a look. This is not as complete as the one I've just shown you. There's Blaupunkt. Let's have a look. And I'll just do a search for Sultan. Oh, we've got a lot of them. Now here I have to revert to that number that I got off the other one. This one is more difficult to figure out. You have to know which one it is. I know it's the 24300 from the previous site. So let me search for that. No, it doesn't have it. Let's try 350 because it would be the Stockholm. No, they don't have it. OK. The other place would be Radio Museum. Now, Radio Museum has become like a standard for most restorers. Let's see if we can find it. This is the page on this particular radio. It gives us a lot of information. Date 64-65. So this went on for two years. Some pictures over here. This certainly looks like ours. Yes, it is. Okay, good. And a lot of information on here on the tubes. 
and so on. So yeah, okay. I know that I can get schematics from here. So they have the service manual as well. It's exactly the same one that I've got. I'm not actually signed up with the Radio Museum. It's just something I've been putting off for no reason at all. But if you are signed up, you can download all this information and it's very, very useful. So that's basically three uh, different sites where you can get this sort of information on European radios. I get asked this all the time. These are the ones I go to. There's also the other option, which is just go to Google and ask them. I do use Electrotania. They have quite a lot of stuff and it's free as well. Electronica-pt.com also has a lot of service manuals, also free. And then you've got all these other service manuals and things like that. And of course, one of the things I sometimes do is instead of writing service manual, I write, I think this is how you spell it, shot plan, which is service, <laughs> okay, service manual in German. Oh, here we go with uh, NVHR. This uh, sometimes gives you a lot better result because it's looking for a German copy. And uh, here's another one. This is one that you have to buy. So we avoid those. Okay, so you get the idea. You get yourself a service manual one way or the other. Makes life a heck of a lot easier. What I now do is start a folder for this project because I want to keep everything in one place. And this is going to be my main folder for the entire project. I'll create another small folder called Media, which is where I'll put all the videos in. In fact, that screen recording that I've just done is going to go in there. So everything that has to do with the video finally will come in here. And the actual schematic that I've downloaded, which is, um, I've changed it to Sultan so I don't get confused. Here it is. And I've got the full service manual, easily accessible. And I can use this for reference at any time. Now, as you probably know, I like to draw, mark out the schematics because I, um, I used to use a, a felt pen and mark the connections that I'd seen, components I changed. If you've watched my videos, you know that I like to mark them off. This is what my record keeping used to look like. It was simple, but first of all, you couldn't correct anything. And then it did create quite a lot of paper. And I've got quite a lot of these files lying around that I'm keeping because you never know when you'll need it again. The computer made it a lot simpler. And to do that, I use Adobe Reader. Now, I prefer to have one sheet of paper, one schematic. As you can see, this thing's got quite a few pages. All right. It's got all this stuff. And it seems to be a pretty big file as well because it's taking a while to load. And this is a Mac Mini M1, so it should be fast. So I need to isolate this. And to do that is actually quite simple. Let's see if I can do it on here. I'm going to go on here. I'm going to say File, Duplicate. This might be protected. I'm not sure. But now we've got a duplicate. And let's see if we can see sidebar. Here we got it. Let's see if I can do that. I want to delete that one. Oh dear. Can I delete that? Edit. Yeah, I can. I can delete that page. I've opened it in uh, the Acrobat Reader again, and I've, I've selected Comment. This is what I normally do. I choose Comment, and usually these guys come up. But this one is secured. I didn't realize that. So this is actually a protected file. You can't edit it. But, and this here, I'm not going to show you how to do this. You can open your browser, and there are services online that unprotect or unlock the file itself. And I'm going to do that. I'm just going to show you the result. I suppose the, the, the guys who created this didn't want changes. I'm doing this, let's call it for um, legitimate use purposes. So I'm going to go ahead and do that anyway. Here I've got an unlocked version of this uh, service manual. And as you can see, it's got four pages. I'm going to delete the ones that I don't want. Edit, delete. Boom. Here's my single. It's, uh, that looks good. My single schematic. And I'm going to save it. And now I've got my uh, complete schematic in one sheet. It's actually oriented right. If it wasn't, I could always, you know, flick it around and get it right. But here's my schematic in one sheet. Now, if I close this, this was done in, 
in preview, but you can use any PDF editor. Now, if I open it with Adobe Acrobat Reader, here we go. Now I've got select comment over here. Let's just get rid of this sidebar. And I've got all my lines on here. Now, this is where I start playing around with, um, with the colors. Let's say that I'm following that line over here. Okay, so I'll choose that there. Green for OK, and I'm going to start there and go up here. And it's a bit big, isn't it? OK, never mind. We'll sort that out in a second. Stop there. That thing's too big, so I can go here and I can choose properties. And on the properties, I've got there's the number of points, so I can go down. I want it to be wider than the line, the line itself, but not too wide that it sort of covers any other components. The color is green. I've got the opacity at 50%. I can make it 100%, but I like to see what's underneath. So I leave it at about just where I can see it properly. And I can see what's underneath, as you can observe there. And I make properties for default. For every time I can now choose this guy, for example, if I choose this again and I want to do this over here, it now is going to take on the properties that I gave it. See that? And that's the way it's done. Now, if I want to choose to mark a component has changed, let's say I change this capacitor, I normally use the line, the, the straight line, and it's already set for red. And here, if I go there and do that, eh, it's a little bit too big, isn't it? The size of these lines will depend on the resolution of your picture, okay? So for every one, every project you start, you might have to just adjust this at the beginning. So properties, let's make this slightly smaller. Yeah, that's, that's good enough. Again, 50% opacity. And there we go. Next time I choose this. Did I choose make? Yeah, I did, I think. I'm not sure if I chose. I didn't. What did I make them? Eight? Never mind. I can just do this. I can go to that guy there and say, make current properties default. Now, if I choose that, it's going to give me exactly the same width or thickness of line. And when I'm when I work on this, I open this file up and I save it. I just keep saving. So every time I open this up, I've got my updated document. And if I wanted to make it simple, I can just erase those guys over there. But I don't really do that. I can make notes on here. I can actually write stuff on here. Sometimes you find components that are different value or you find that the schematic is slightly different for this particular model. You can actually use your text. Where is it? one of these text box, and you can make a note on there. The point is that you end up with a document that has the full history of everything you've done on there, and it makes life so much easier. And then, of course, it's just a question of just coming back and keep doing this sort of thing. And um, at the end, I end up with a record, which will be in this folder called Blaupunk Sultan, and all the documentation, photographs that I take, information that I pick up and, and go and get on the net if I need it, I've got everything on here and I'm ready to go. There's one more little step that I normally take before I start a restoration project, and that is to make sure that I've got replacements for the tubes or that I have a place where I can get one to try out if one of these is uh, completely dead. Now, very, very seldom are these tubes completely dead. I've done dozens of restorations and I can probably count on one hand cases where the tubes were completely, completely gone. If you've watched my channel for a long time, you probably have seen those cases. but. This particular one has a, an ECL86, and this is a two-function tube. They're pretty difficult, to, or they're expensive to get hold of, but I had none of these in stock. So I decided to put this on hold until I got some of these tubes, and I've got them. Here's an ECH81 that's used over there. These are very common. Here is an ECL86. That's that guy there. I've got a few of these that arrived very recently. Here's another ECH81. Here is, inside here is an ECC85. I ran out of these recently and ordered a whole lot of them. And um, what I've got missing is this guy over here, which is an EAF801. I don't have any of those, but if this thing is kaput, I've got one in the recently restored Saba Stereo 1. That's my radio, so if this thing is completely gone, I can always remove that one, put it in there for testing, and I'll be able to make sure that I finish the project until I get some of these in stock. So the idea is to get hold of stuff that uh, you may need. And because I live on an island, it's more important. These things take time to get here. It's not a question of just going on the net and receiving it the next day. Sometimes it takes weeks. 
And even some of you who've sent me some stuff, you know that uh, we sometimes think it's lost. <laughs> it takes ages. But I wanted to get these tubes in stock, and um, that's why this project was um, basically put on hold for a while. But it does serve the purpose of, uh, of me trying to describe to you this, the various considerations that I take before I start a project. And that really was the whole purpose of my doing this uh, in answer to a lot of questions that I get from you on the emails that you sent me. But I wanted to really give you a, a more in-depth explanation of how I go about this. And of course, the next step is simply start the restoration. So I'll be desoldering the speaker wires and uh, getting that out of the way. Remove four screws down here. Usually it's four. This particular one, I think, comes out separately because you've got that plug on there. So I remove this from the uh, cabinet. I'll have the cabinet completely cleared to do the restoration of that when the time comes and put this on my contraption to be able to access it and rotate it and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen that. But this thing is ready to go. And it's not going to go ahead yet because I've actually been waiting for a really super huge beast that's just arrived. I'm going on a trip for the weekend and then I'll be starting that next week. I'll leave you uh, waiting to find out what it is. But it really is a great radio. It's a monster of a radio. That's all I'm going to say. And for now, that's all I'm going to say, except to thank you for your company. Hope this has been uh, enlightening to some of you. Hope it's answered some of your questions. And um, if there are any more, don't hesitate to ask. Send me an email or comments. So thank you for your company. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I really hope you've enjoyed that. And if you have, please click like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the description below. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.